The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's FISDAP webinar on June 4th, 2018. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody that you're muted, so please send a chat message with any questions, and we will do our best to address them during the webinar. Our topic today is Appendix G and how to currently track it in FISDAP. We're invited, we've invited David Page, Director of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum at UCLA to share his perspective. Not only was Dave one of the original creators of FISDAP, but he has also visited many programs and currently teaches at an accredited program that is tracking Appendix G requirements. This is the first of a series of webinars and podcasts that Dave will be doing on FISDAP tricks and tips. So without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to David Page. Thank you. And um, we, we have, uh, this seems to be a very popular topic these days, so we have a large group online attending and I'm, uh, uh, I'm very thankful for all of your, your wonderful uh, attendance and participation. So um, please send questions in the chat room and um, we'll try and get started uh, right away. Uh, as always, I want to make sure that people have a way to get a hold of me. If you want to um, uh, question anything I'm saying or want to dialogue about it, want to uh, suggest an improvement uh, in FISDAP, I, I uh, can sometimes, um, uh, I guess, maybe uh, complain loud enough or um, no. Uh, FISDAP has always been really great about making improvements uh, with the whole community and um, now is no different, but I do want you to be able to get a hold of me directly. This is a Google Voice number. You can text it or, or leave a message or call directly and I'll be able to answer if I'm not uh, tied up at that moment. Uh, I I want to first kind of review a little bit of uh, the portfolio and, and Appendix G. And it's not, this is not going to be a comprehensive review. I think uh, um, there's uh, webinars on the registry website and the COE website. Side. But I just wanted to summarize a few key things that are sometimes mis misperceptions or misconceptions, uh, and um, uh, and want to make sure that people understand sort of the the purpose and the intent behind some of these documents. Uh, there's there's a, a big confusion sometimes behind recommendations and requirements, and so uh, it's it's really important to actually keep the two straight. And these documents didn't both come out at the same time, and so sometimes. The uh, you know Appendix G talks to the portfolio, but doesn't exactly address all of the pieces of the portfolio. So we're still, uh, I think, in a situation where we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, agree to the spirit of some of these documents, and then um, in terms of the latest iterations, make sure we adhere to what it is that these bodies uh, want us to do. As you know, the standards uh, in the COA uh, are all about adequate numbers of patients and and uh, exposure. It's uh, not not just hospital and clinical affiliations, but field internships. And where that isn't possible, then then uh, simulation. And it's about showing progression, sequencing from the classroom to the lab to the hospital to the field, so that people have a chance to practice those skills before they have to do them on live patients as well as establishing minimum numbers of encounters that all students will actually complete successfully prior to graduation. And that's these three kind of tenets were described in the webinar that Gordy Cox did on May 17th. Dr. Cox is uh, an amazing uh, person and has helped uh, all of us in the field so much. And so I would encourage you to uh, listen to the actual uh, webinar. It's on the COE website right on the top at the moment. but um, uh, it has uh, valuable information about how they're interpreting it. I won't go over all of it. I'm just going to try and highlight some of the concepts here that the registry's portfolio went through uh, when we did the rollouts for that uh, for that new portfolio. And that is that uh, the idea of progression came from uh, sort of this concept of do individual skills first, then try them on some sort of more classroom scenarios, then the scenarios uh, increase in fidelity, and then eventually uh, students actually have exposure to hospital and uh, field clinicals or uh, at the end, a capstone event uh, in the field. The, the problem has sometimes been that because there were 33 skill sheets and everybody thought, oh, we better do those like five times uh, to get each skill done, people spent all their time doing skills and very little scenarios. 
uh, it's the danger of printing something um, like in, uh, what's printed in the portfolio um, because with these 33 skill sheets everybody thought I got to get all these individuals done and then I'll go to scenarios uh, we spent a lot of time on the registry rollouts telling people not to do this unfortunately uh, people are still trying to do this as they first implement the portfolio and now appendix G they're stuck in an individual skill kind of a mode and it's uh, really really detrimental and hopefully by uh, the end of this webinar you can see how uh, the individual skill phase of this portfolio should be pretty pretty quick uh, that that uh, that myth is what we're going to try and debunk today instead what I'd like to propose to you is that every time uh, your your students learn a new skill that from nearly almost the first day of class you do some sort of scenarios now maybe some of these are, are quick um, and uh, they shouldn't be uh, you know very very long um, but uh, the the idea is that um, as we kind of perform these we get better and better and incorporate them into these scenarios so as soon as we for example learn to do an assessment here um, then uh, in in that case if it is an instructor checkoff then we begin doing them in scenarios and um, as we learn to perhaps do an airway then we're going to immediately apply that into a scenario uh, so eventually we'll reach a moment where we've finished uh, acquiring all the new skills and then we can just focus on all uh, scenarios and even maybe high fidelity simulation but um, uh, but waiting until we actually get you know uh, uh, these individually done uh, to death has been a big problem especially trying to do them all so how do we do this uh, differently Obviously, then there's hospital and field. Uh, so uh, it's the idea that if, in fact, um, we have an instructor checkoff required of an individual, these are for individual lab skills, that we would first do uh, IV administration or oral medications, if, if that's the example that we pick, that um, we, as soon as we know how to do that skill, we now incorporate it into scenarios. Scenarios uh, can be as simple as you know, a, a single patient here. So we've got a patient and uh, uh, we have a team leader and a team member. Um, we'll come back to this drawing a couple of times. And so I want to kind of orient everybody uh, to the, the, very, is the, the simplest form of the, of the scenario possible. Um, and uh, in this case, it could be an instructor or a lead instructor. And the instructor can have the scenario in the in the bank, if you're using a, a FISDAP uh, tracking system, you can actually use this, uh, the FISDAP scenario bank to keep track of your scenarios as well, and even download them to your iSimulate uh, just with the push of a button. So um, in this progression, I also want to point out that uh, it's been thought that you need to reach this moment to actually uh, begin your hospital clinicals. In fact, that's not the case. Um, the portfolio and the COA know that in some cases programs can't just do didactic, then do hospital, then do field. And so sometimes hospital opportunities present themselves and if they've already learned to do IVs here and uh, they've done some IVs in simulations enough that they've been checked off by an instructor, if it's an instructor checkoff uh, event, that once they've done that they could actually do a hospital clinical on IVs or uh, say for example they've uh, been checked off on airway and in the individual skills and then they've done scenarios uh, and enough of them to really feel comfortable um, we would see that happening simultaneously this was uh, represented in the graphic on page four in the national registry where these overlap uh, overlapping concentric circles show that in fact you can be still working on some of these laboratory phase individual skills when the students begin to do some of their clinicals. And they call, this is very important, they call the field experience different than the, the capstone field internship. So the capstone field internship is really when they're team leading 
um, as, uh, as represented here. And, uh, and, but they can still ride along and actually perform some of the skills in the field, practice some of their uh, leadership in, in the cases of BLS calls until they really feel comfortable and then and really uh, at the very end be able to incorporate all of their learning into a capstone event. This melding, this mixture, oftentimes gets people very confused because they really think, okay, well, I need to get the skills done here before we start in on the scenarios. And in fact, that's, that's just not the case. And I, I wanted to make sure that those graphics are pointed out so that you see them and understand uh, linearly. We're going from left to right. This is you know, walking through paramedic school. And um, often, um, because of, it's explained in this linear fashion, people get, get confused. And I'm going to propose a top to bottom explanation as well. So um, uh, in Appendix G, I also want to point out that uh, a lot of people have said, oh, is FISDAP compliant or when is FISDAP going to incorporate Appendix G? And it's kind of a question that drives me nuts, actually, because um, we used FISDAP to determine what would be maybe realistic uh, and all of the platinum and, and uh, other, other vendors participate in the process of saying this is what we kept track of and this is what we know to be the goals. So, um, so these are not necessarily, Appendix G is not uh, a reporting tool except for the traditional matrix that we always had where we're going to report an average number of contacts for all students. But we do need to set minimum requirements. So what this is is all about goal setting, which has always been a part of FISDAP. And so it's a little bit funny to say, when is, when is FISDAP going to incorporate Appendix G? Well, gosh, we already have goal sets for graduation. And this is exactly what we're keeping track of, is how many patients should, should they lead or do assessments on that are newborn patients or pediatric patients or medical patients. So when we say 60, when the COE recommends 60 patients, um, we either need to have 60 written into our, our goal set, or we need to come up with a really good rationale as to why our program cannot get to 60. The idea here is that uh, um, we're, we're, we're following good practices to say, uh, you know, we, we can and our students should be exposed to at least 30 trauma patients. Some of that can come from simulation. Some people have even suggested should there be a ratio, like two simulations are worth one real patient. I would highly discourage that, actually. Um, the more patient contact they have in the field, the better. Uh, our good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Paul Werfel, was talking about this. If you're working in, in New York City, you're going to get a lot of hands-on, in-field clinical experience. And, and so is it necessary to go as much to a hospital um, because you're, you're seeing that in the field and the environment that you're in? That's great. But as, as Dr. Cox would say, uh, if you can't find it in one spot, maybe in another, and where we might not have many pediatric cardiac arrests, then we have to do those in simulation, make sure we understand them, uh, and make sure that people do them well. So um, one, uh, one question here uh, 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 from uh, Romy. Hi, Romy. Um, are you uh, indicating that instructor checkoffs can be completed in a scenario, or do they have to occur in, in individual skills? That is a fantastic question. Some of these skills um, are actually starred in Table 2, which we'll go to next. Um, and where the National Registry indicated with a star that these had to be instructor checkoffs, then those are the skills, there's 17 of them, that need to be assessed by an instructor, and we think um, that it's best for them to be done before you start an actual scenario. So in the case of uh, where, we, where the COE is recommending two, uh, that, that, the, that you obtain um, a patient history two times before starting scenarios, one of those times needs to be the instructor checkoff. Now, I would say that you start with one peer, and then after the peer says, ah, you're good to go, go see the instructor, you see the instructor and you get your instructor check off. Now you can incorporate that skill into your scenarios. Where you have 10, for example, in the oral tracheal intubation realm, the idea is for them to practice that a little bit more before they, they apply it into 
the scenario realm. But absolutely, in the, uh, in the scenario realm, instructor checkoffs are not only possible, but also recommended. So instructor verification that the scenarios are running well is a fantastic best practice, and I'll show you how we can document that. Uh, again, uh, you'll have to set minimums. They're all in red in the in the spreadsheet because by the time you start punching them in, if they meet the number two, then they turn green. Uh, but you can exceed those requirements, and hopefully we all will. Here are uh, in table. Uh, this is table four actually, and it's showing the uh, basic competencies that are going to be evaluated peer to peer um, at least one time here. And these these are skills they already know: spinal immobilization, joint splinting. So um, when you listen to the webinar from Dr. Cox, and after having talked with him and 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 working with him on these issues, you you know that you can actually complete these in a scenario. Um, these are peer evaluation uh, only needed. I think that if we're supervising an, uh, an evaluation and entering an instructor verified evaluation is better, but it can happen that peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, they know how to recognize how to immobilize a, a patient properly. And um, once they've practiced that skill, they incorporate it into the scenarios. And in this case, there is no instructor checkoff required. It's, uh, it's kind of an, a bonus and a plus. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, when, when we look at some of the skill sheets, some of the very detailed skill sheets, which we'll, I'll show you here in a minute, those are meant for initial formative learning. And people have gone uh, really haywire with that and thought that every single skill and every single iteration needs to be needs to re receive one of these checklists. That's true in the individual early stages, the initial checkoff, not necessarily in uh, the uh, scenario checkoffs. And Gordy had a really some really good comments about that. But uh, um, the idea is is that we these goals we probably already are doing many of them. So it's just a matter of documenting and tracking this. I also wanna point out that Appendix G is not an actual report. It's just a goal setting exercise. So oftentimes people say, well, well, when is when is FISDAP gonna program this in as a report? And um, in fact, you know, this is a, a, many of the tables, most of the tables, uh, other than the table one that has averages, it's, it's not a per student report. It actually is a, a goal setting exercise for the program to say this is how many they can actually achieve. Now, uh, I, I know that FISDEP is working on this exact spreadsheet, so you can type in your goals there. Uh, and that will be another webinar that we'll do on tips and tricks on how to set your goals. But uh, I, I do want to point out that this is actually currently still available and ha always has been, and the goal setting processes I think is a critical one for any uh, kind of program to say okay this is what we expect from uh, this this seminar or this semester or this section or this block and uh, and this is what what we expect in the next block so there's lots of ways to do that in FISDAP um, that already exist and Appendix G is just uh, asking us to make sure that these items are in fact uh, being recorded and thankfully, when when we set up Appendix G, we knew what was being tracked in FISDAP, as well as other commercially available products. So we know that this is something that if the students document, it will be in, that, in the system. So um, not a report. This is not a report. Uh, very, very important. So some people uh, do better when we describe uh, goal sets from top to bottom. and and. Uh, Leslie Hernandez at the University of Texas San Antonio was actually showing me how she wrote it out for her students and instead of going left to right um, she thought you know if I could just explain this uh, for each each section of the course right so it doesn't matter if you do you know session one or class one or course one or uh, lab number one but let's just call it the block of skills we're going to watch a demo or a video, we're gonna uh, either present it in class or watch it online, uh, of obtaining a patient history, normal physical exam, and a trauma physical exam. Then we're gonna come in and do some practice peer checkoffs. So this is after you, know, you get a chance to demo it, people get a chance to practice it. You've done this in the lab uh, from for, forever. Uh, this is no different than any, any time before. The only difference is here that Leslie has taken the, the time to actually document, okay, this is where we're going to do obtain a history in block number one. 
Now, they get checked off for, uh, for it as an instructor. So if they practiced it one time and got it right and their student peer says, go for it, you can go get, uh, uh, obtain the patient history from your instructor, then right then and there, they obtain the check off. And now, that very afternoon or later in the day, or even later in that morning, they can incorporate that into their lab, their scenario. So in, in our world, at, at least at UCLA, we have stu students submitting their scenarios, um, which in this case, uh, because it's the first block ever, it would be the BLS trauma block. So we're talking about, you know, very simple stuff they should know because they're already EMTs in this case. Appendix G is all about uh, uh, the paramedic level that uh, they should already be EMTs. So they should know how to take care of a patient uh, uh, with BLS skills. And if they bring a scenario that's a BLS trauma, then that very time that we're going to talk about obtaining history in the trauma exam, we're going to then actually do a big group scenario in which an instructor is watching and checking people off. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that probably that if those scenarios, 20 minutes each, is about an hour for uh, each team leader to get checked off, and then uh, we can break into smaller groups if that if your if your labs allow that. That's you're really entirely up to each program. But uh, it was really helpful for me to see this, and, and I think I wanted to commend Leslie for thinking of it top to bottom instead of left to right, because people are really confused about all the different columns in the, in the new Appendix G uh, report. But in fact, it's just the same progression, the, the individual skill, then we go to scenario. Um, and I hope this helps uh, people kind of think of it and lay it out on paper going, block one, we're doing these skills. Doesn't mean we're covering all of them, but we're going to scenario right away as soon as you learn the, 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 um, the technique. All right, so step by step, how do you do that in FISDAP? This is kind of the tips and tricks portion of this webinar because I think people, uh, people have said, well, um, I want to see exactly where you click so that it shows up on the right report so that I don't have to think about it. And I want to be able to tell my students something that's really simple. So we are going to go back to the future, back to the very, very basics of how we want to track labs. And we'll start with that same progression, that concept that we're going to add an individual skill evaluation. So think of this in the formative stages as a checklist, a detailed checklist um, that we're going to make sure they have. Now, now we can certainly do that on paper, right? And actually, FISDEP will let us even take a picture and upload it as part of their shift. It won't really know what the picture's all about because it could be an EKG or it could be anything else. But we could do that. We could do it that way. Um, Instead, FISDAP in its, in its uh, iteration, and, and I always want to say FISDAP in terms of our community, because really that's who guides the development of FISDAP. Um, what we did was we added a lab practice item. And so I'm going to show you how to enter a lab practice item for just that one or two or three or four times that people are going to enter an individual skill. There's a question from the audience, so I'm going to just uh, wait here, and it's from Daniel, um, uh, and it says, that sounds great for individual uh, progression from skill to scenario. How do I manage that class-wide scale um, at, with 24 students? So let's, let's do that um, in, in progression, and I'll show you kind of how you're going to be able to incorporate a whole lot of students and um, get a whole lot of scenarios done with a whole lot of skills done very quickly. So, um, but let's just start with the basics. This is how we would enter a lab practice item. Uh, I want to go back to, this is an individual skill, so it's out of context, it's completely, I, I still would recommend that you, you know, begin from the very time they start to do IVs or endotracheal tubes that they're on the floor because um, that's the harder skill to do, not on a table and then having to relearn it on the floor. And we're going to just track one iteration of this. So we're going to go to shifts, then patient uh, skills or skills, uh, sorry, skills and patient care. And um, Johnny Gage here is going to have a shift that's going to be on a particular date. So as an instructor, you can pull that down. In their shift, it's going to be here at Brackettville Station. And uh, they're going to enter uh, that particular shift. In that shift, you have lab practice items. 
Um, and when you actually click on the drop-down menu, you will have um, oxygen administration, uh, and you can actually add any checklist into FISDAP. I encourage you not to add too many. Um, we, we just don't need that many. These are the lab practice items that you really want to see enforced. Uh, so um, if you want to track all 33 skill sheets from the registry skills uh, portfolio, that's fine. Again, these are individual, out of context kind of uh, performances, and there should be only one or two or three um, so that it's like, okay, you got this down, now we can go to scenarios. Uh, when you hit, uh, hit one of these, so uh, it doesn't matter which one we hit, you'll pop up a full skill sheet um, that has the national registry scoring if you want to use that. Remember, the registry doesn't require you to use their skill sheets. You can use them. You can also use your own skill sheets. So it doesn't matter which skill sheet you're using as long as you're documenting performance. And that also means that um, you get to score it the way you would prefer to score it, or you use the 0, 1, 2 scale that, uh, that, that the registry uh, recommended we do. Uh, in, in FISDEP, you have critical criteria, no different than anything else. And then at the end, um, you can mark the time it took. And, and uh, I hope somebody listening here that's been tracking this, because I know you have been, uh, is wanting to do a nice research project to, see, project to see exactly how much time it takes to do all these things. Um, I think you'll find that if we're not completely obsessed with doing, you know, 10 or 15 of each one of these, especially for the BLS skills, um, we'll, we'll be able to move through them fairly quickly and get right to scenarios, which is really where we need to spend our time. Uh, if, in fact, you would rather do this as a pass-fail, uh, um, neither the registry nor the COA will fault you for that. It's uh, this kind of uh, yes-no, an instructor checked you off, and who exactly checked you off? Was it a, a student or a peer? Um, and, and that would mean that on paper you'd do, have documented this. Again, FISDEP allows you to take a picture of that and upload it to the shift, or um, simply you can keep track of it on paper, if you will, and just keep ta add the tabulations uh, in FISDEP. So that, that's one iteration. I'm gonna suggest that uh, tracking the full skill sheet is better uh, than this quick yes, no. Uh, initially, but then afterwards, actually tracking the uh, yes-no uh, situation might be better. What that looks like for any particular student, and I, I really encourage you to upload their pictures, et cetera, is that you have a, a little dashboard here for lab goals, um, and the lab goals uh, show them a nice little widget. Uh, the widget shows you peer-to-peer -peer versus instructor. Um, you can see here that at UCLA, for the student that I pulled up, we at that time didn't have any instructor required checkoffs, which obviously now with Appendix G and, and with the portfolio, uh, we know for sure they have to actually have those. And, um, and you would see how many of these peer-to-peer -peer they had to do uh, to make sure that they were uh, documented. This is really important. This is a widget. Um, it is not a report. So people have started to use the widget as if it was a graduation report. If you actually click on the next button, you will get to the graduation goal sets, which you set for your program. So that's Appendix G, setting your goals and then completing them. Uh, the trouble with this is that people started, started to see these lab goals as kind of the only way to keep track of the portfolio. And I'm gonna show you that once you enter scenarios, these, these become obsolete. They really, they're nice to have just for those initial checkoffs, but that's just initial, it's just uh, the beginning. So um, really, in, in, uh, once you enter the lab practice item, just to finish up, um, the instructor who's verifying this, watching each, each one, so you know somebody's floating around the lab going, okay, go. Um, somebody else is tracking and documenting it. You can confirm those very, very easily. So this is a little quick tip. Um, just go to reports. So a lot of people don't know to do this. They go individually into each student. And boy, that would take a long time. UCLA has 42 students at a time uh, in labs, and, and uh, it, it'd be a nightmare to go 42 times in different students. And then go to evals and sheets and skill sheets. And just say, give me all of the evaluations done by anyone on any students on this particular day. Once you have that, you'll see a grid that looks like this. 
and for any student that has completed this. So, you know, we have Johnny Gage, we have Nurse Dixie, um, we know who evaluated each one, so we know if there's some pencil whipping. We can go down the list and just go check, 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 check. Um, that's correct, it's pass, and we are done confirming this particular uh, validation process. Uh, I think part of this, this uh, craziness has been, well, what needs to be audited and what isn't? And the audit button was really in FISDEP meant for uh, a audit of data in the field internship. This is a quick way to look and see, is my lab being productive? Are people actually doing what they're supposed to? And then going through and saying, yep, I saw this person and they were doing that skill. I can confirm that that, uh, that was indeed a pass. We know students only document passes, so that's not great. It should really actually be um, that we should see some fails here. Otherwise, are we perfect first time through all the time? So not ideal that these are all pass, 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 pass. But um, this is a nice report, and it shows the whole uh, the whole day's activity. If you just want to isolate it to that day or that week, um, you can actually look and see how effective your labs have been. Now. Let's transition to scenarios which will, should hopefully answer Daniel's question. So now we've done one or two of these skills and we're going to you know, track it in a scenario. Remember, these are potentially happening the same day. Learn a new skill, now apply it to the scenario, and you're adding it to all the other things that you did before. So step by step, we need to start to think about scenarios not as lab skills. Um, this was really kind of the uh, nightmare that um, that we, in, in our infinite wisdom, wanted to think of these differently. But in fact, they're all patients. And if we keep thinking that we're preparing people for a career, we want them to document patient care. So you perform something and you actually have to um, document what you did. Just if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done kind of story. Uh, unfortunately, when we went to scenarios, people went, uh, well, just document the skills that are going on in the scenario. And I need you to take a step back and kind of go back to the future, which is that we're really tracking patients. So we're going to add a patient to each one of these uh, actual records. Now, it's always about the patient. So, you know, everybody has an age, a gender, uh, and, and so we know that now, we, when, when the appendix G says, oh, got to make sure you have some newborns, got to make sure you have some, some adults, you got to make sure that they have these types of complaints, quickly instructors went, ah, you know, I'm going to have to have on these skill sheets, I have to have the kind of complaint. Ooh, that created a nightmare. So I really want to encourage you to just kind of put that aside and start thinking just like you would in the field, just like you would in clinical. These are patients that they're seeing. They're just seeing them in lab. Those count as live encounters. This is a live human that they're doing an assessment on. So if you click on live human and you're in, this, in, in a simulation or a scenario, that is part of what Appendix G is asking you to do. Now, um, let's take our patient that fell and now they're, they're sitting up complaining of neck pain and knee pain, okay? And we're gonna keep it super simple here. It, I, I'd like to give my students the simplest instructions so that there's absolutely no way to screw this up. If you're doing a scenario, you enter a patient. That's it. So when people panic about, oh, how am I going to keep track of all these different things that they're doing in simulation and in scenarios, I have to just ask you, take a step back, put in a patient. Now, um, let's walk through what that looks like. So you have a team leader. Um, here's our team leader dude, uh, and he, you have a team member, likely, there's partners, right? Um, gone are the days in which we just practice things in isolation. That's the whole point of the portfolio, crew, crew resource management, culture of safety. You want to see how these team members interact. And we're going to ask, um, in, in the case where we have a small cohort or we want to really keep it to the very minimum. So uh, uh, if you ask Leslie Hernandez, for example, what they're doing in their program, they're training uh, the military folks, the army folks that are going through paramedic school. Um, they're, they're entering a room. There's two of them. They're gonna run a scenario. And now Leslie has pre-programmed. She's actually got it down to 99 different scenarios that they're gonna do. 
Um, I don't know that it's actually 99. Uh, it might be less, it might be more, um, but that's what she's doing to just trial uh, what they're going to do. And um, uh, when, and this is throughout the entire paramedic program. So um, before you go, whoa, 99, that's a lot. Think um, you get a th walk through it with me. This person is actually um, either observing or doing a first of them get evaluated on these skills. Now we're going to ask each student in the case where you really only have two people and your patient in the lab to enter a patient. Now the team leader adds a patient because they were the team leader and maybe they did some skills, maybe not. And the team member is going to add some uh, some patients because they, after all, did participate, they observed, and they might have done some skills on those particular patients. So think of this as a as a individual student record, and so we want each student to have their patients. Um, someday we'll be able to just enter one patient and say, well, this you know this student did this and this, this student did the other. But for now. Um, uh, until FISDEP catches up with some of those uh, improvements. And FISDEP is always improving. So, uh, you know, we, we made a choice years and years ago when people even said, why are you doing this on the internet? I just want to see it CD. We want a database that is on a floppy disk and we don't want to worry about the internet. The internet has all sorts of connection problems, et cetera. Um, we said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to work together. So that means if we're going to work together, we can actually track together and benchmark and do research together. So let's just make sure that we're you know, using the latest tools available. So FISDEP is always improving, always releasing a, a, a little bit more, an improved report, uh, fixing this as the community, and I do mean us, the community of instructors say, hey, how about this? Let's fix this. And could we improve that? So there are always changes coming. There are changes coming coming every week, but uh, particularly this August, there'll be some more very user-friendly uh, tools for addressing Appendix G. And that's going to be a value added, but when people say, well, does FISDEP actually, is FISDEP compliant with Appendix G? When is FISDEP going to start, you know, tracking Appendix G? You kind of scratch your head and go, well, actually, that's that's kind of what it was designed to do in the, in the first place. Um, so track a patient in simulation, it's super easy. And um, if in fact, uh, after, you know, so these are, these are intended to add an 18 year old male here, or let's just make them a 78 year old male uh, that fell. And, and uh, remember we have neck pain, we have uh, knee pain. So maybe we splinted the knee and then maybe we applied a, a spine board. So uh, we're getting credit for a geriatric patient. We're getting credit for uh, a male patient. Let's, let's assume um, we're putting a splint. Maybe we did uh, a physical exam. We obtained a history. All of these things are happening at once. And if the patient happens to um, also have fallen because they have an altered mental status or caused an altered mental status, then we also have altered mental status going at the same time. And if you want the instructor to evaluate each one of these things, they could, they could enter an individual lab practice item while they're standing there saying, I see that uh, Jane Doe is doing this assessment, they're the team leader, and I'm going to enter an eval for them. I'm going to show you a better way, but you could do that. I'm not going to recommend that you do this uh, for every every scenario. Like Gordy said on his webinar, uh, that would be cr a crazy thing, but it's possible. I'm going to show you kind of a pit crew way to do that. As you can see, these are already in FISDAP. They're already categories that were set up. We actually have more complaints than what the uh, COA tracks. So um, it is a matter of telling the students when the COA says altered mental status and there's a goal for altered mental status, then we have a goal for altered mental status. But you as a program might actually set programmatic goals that go above and beyond. I know, God forbid, but we might go above and beyond minimum requirements for the COE and say, we really actually want to see these kinds of complaints, um, you know, headache, dizziness. Uh, we, we want to see that they can handle those complaints. Either way, if you want to keep it to the bare minimum, that's fine. But I think it is important to show the students when you keep track of your patient care, you're going to want to document all that applies. That is the same thing they're going to do when they go work in the field. You don't want to have a, a run report that, that is missing information. So teaching them only put in one or two things is actually setting them up for a graduating 
in the future and having paramedics who don't document well, which we really don't want to do. So the best thing is to document as accurately as we can and, and actually document everything that applies. Now, as you can uh, see, the registry in its portfolio said, you need to be a team member uh, 10 times, you need to be a team leader 10 times, and um, we wanna see these types of uh, patients. So uh, a seizure, a psychiatric patient, et cetera. Now, some of these things are complaints. So when somebody says, when the registry says, I, you know, we, we recommend that they do cases with chest pain and abdominal pain, then abdominal pain is in the system, chest pain is in the system. So they're just gonna go along and just document what they see when the patient's complaining of these things. Let the computer spit out a report that says, hey, you met all the goals. Um, it, 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 in the uh, in in the crazed uh, kind of let's have a skill sheet for every one of those people started thinking I have to do a scenario for each one that's just an individual scenario. That is not the case. Um, if you have a patient who's an obstetric patient and has a seizure, you know, yay, okay, well then then these are complex patients, which is what the COE wants you to start practicing. So it's a good thing to have these complex pathophysiologies. We don't wanna just do one thing, one thing, one thing, just to tick off the boxes. And that's really, really important. That's why FISDAP is ideal, because we can keep track of multiple things. In some cases, they're complaints, and in some cases, they're actually impressions or differential diagnoses. So um, when, when that's the case, you don't really have to think much. Um, we, have, we are thinking, oh, well, where does this match? But in fact, the student never even needs to think about that. Just teach them to document a patient uh, complaint and they'll click all that apply. And little by little, they'll keep mounting on the complaints that they've seen. Now, that's why setting minimum goals of like two seem pretty low if you start to think, well, if patient complaining of chest pain and abdominal pain and altered mental status, they might see a lot more of that, especially in simulation and then in, in the clinical. So some of these, these goals of two are just uh, minimum, minimum rock bottoms that um, probably are, are not you know, enough. Now, aside from complaints, remember we're trying to make sure that we're documenting what the patient says, how, how, how my chest hurts, but also the differential diagnosis that's going through our head, and is that a pulled muscle because we were lifting, or is that you know, a, a, an acute coronary syndrome kind of a, a pain? So in the primary impression, we actually have differential diagnoses, right? They're, they're, they're the impression. And so in the case where it's not a complaint, it might be an impression. The beauty of this is that you're teaching the students to just document like they're gonna do it in the field. Tell us what the patient was complaining of, tell us what you think is wrong with the patient. And these will immediately match up to the things that the registry wanted people to be practicing. And yes, they're in alphabetical order, whereas uh, you know, in, in, on, on the skill sheet, they're maybe not in alphabetical order, but the portfolio isn't requiring you to have that in that format. So it seems like uh, just kind of more intuitive that the drop-down menu would be easy to find and quickly to, to populate. And um, once I start drawing all the arrows of where it's mapped into FISDAP, you'll see that it's all there. Um, and where it isn't a actual uh, differential diagnosis, there's one thing that maybe not, could be considered not a differential diagnosis, and that's a, a dysrhythmia. So what is a dysrhythmia? I've had plenty of conversations with Gordy about this, but uh, essentially anything that's not a normal sinus rhythm is a dysrhythmia. So when it says C2 of those, that would mean that that's a really rock bottom goal because you would think that we'd want some SVT and some atrial fib and then maybe you know some VTAC and maybe some VFib and who knows, maybe some PEA or some sort of 12-lead uh, 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 left bundle uh, STEMI. So it really is crazy that these goals are, you know, in some cases so low and people are so worried about hitting them. Um, I know this graphic looks complicated, but to the student, it's simple. You see a patient, you document. And essentially you're asking them for two top differentials, your primary impression, your secondary impression, that's it. So that's how you can, uh, um, uh, uh, Get, get to very, very simple uh, methodology. Okay, there's a question here 
um, if I, I think I heard you correctly, in the lab, you could use a standardized patient, yes you could, which uh, could be another classmate, it might, yeah, I'd prefer not to be a classmate, but you could, and um, you could have a, a, you could have a quest, a guest a simulation patient to perform the scenario. You could have a guest or quest simulation patient. Uh, you do want to practice skills in the most realistic way possible, so uh, train like you're going to fight, and so I would say a team leader, team member. Now, what about evaluation? I said before you could go back and fill out a skill sheet for every one of these, but um, I want to keep things so simple so that they do the same thing in the field, they do the same thing in the hospital, they do the same thing in the lab. Very, very simple, right? Every single time. So here we have a preceptor, it's named preceptor sign-off because it was thought of to be in the field, um, but it's an evaluation. The student self-evaluates, I did that, I could have done that better, I did that well, I did that well, and we're using the same scale so that there's no question that from day one we're learning to self-assess. Do I need to improve on that? Was Would I have been prompted to do something if, if I needed to? And so we're using the same grid that happens to be on the paperwork that is in the on the registry uh, portfolio. So if you recall, these are the same team ship here. There's patient interview, history gathering, physical exam. Um, so the students see this, they self-evaluate or the preceptor evaluates them, and and we got you covered. Done. There's the evaluation. Now, if you want to also use as a reference the full evaluation, that's great. If you want to enter each evaluation, that's great too. That's extra. But I think sometimes um, in the middle of simulation, it's hard to keep up with all the things that are happening. So if you think of these, uh, this uh, preceptor sign-off within the patient care report, then it goes pretty quickly. Now, the student can enter that or they can hand it to an instructor and say, okay, I have self-assessed, this is what I think, I am God's gift to paramedicine, and uh, we might say, well, actually, you think you're God's gift to paramedicine, but humility is actually one of the 11 points of professional behavior, and you might want to insert an oral airway, or, oh, oh, you didn't insert an oral airway, so we're going we're gonna to give you a zero for this team lead, next time you need to improve on that. Now, we're going to then run reports that say how many times were you a, success for a successful team leader, and we will be able to see in, a, in the same graduation report that we've always used if, if we've met the graduation goals, i.e. Appendix G. So um, another question here from Rebecca. I'm confused. You're counting this as live patient counters in lab. Yes, they're live patient counters in lab if, in fact, there's a, there's a person. And these are live patients, absolutely. Ask Gordy if you wish, but you're absolutely correct. These are live patient counters and they can be counted. That's why setting really low numbers seems crazy. So you can set numbers in lab and you can set numbers in, in the field, you can set numbers in the hospital, or you can set an overall global number. Appendix G is saying, global numbers, and then in some cases it's saying these have to be performed in lab as a scenario, these have to be performed uh, in, in the field. So that's how you can separate, okay, I need to do these uh, in, which, in which area. When you run your reports, and this is the beauty of doing this so simply, you can tell it, just show me what they've done, done in the hospital, just show me what they've done in the field, and if they're meeting their graduation goals, those will turn green because you've said this is what I want in this in this in each of these areas. Um, by the way, uh, if you're going through a site visit, a site visitor will want to see that if you set a minimum, you made your minimum. You can set whatever minimums you want and have criteria for why you only want to do one of these and 500 of those. Um, actually, you only have to document less than the recommended minimums as to criteria why but you have to actually meet your goals. You can't let this, a student slip by who didn't actually make their goal. So back to live patients. They get through all of their clinicals. They never saw a whatever, pediatric arrest. Well, at the end of the program, they're gonna be simulating pediatric arrest, maybe even getting ready for an out-of-hospital scenario from the registry, and so they're gonna actually check off on that 
simulated pediatric cardiac arrest. And in that case, it's not live technically because it's a mannequin, but um, but you get my drift. If it's a pediatric asthma and you have your um, either one of the student's sons or daughters coming in, that is a live interaction and it does count. Obviously, we're going to want to have them do it in the field. Obviously, we're going to try and make that happen with daycare centers and, and, and pediatric ERs. But when it's not possible, we have to make sure they actually know it before they leave. So um, a question from Doug on the live scenario question. What if we use a high fidelity simulation for a for scenario? So I think of high fidelity simulation as really realistic. So that can be a human or a piece of plastic. In the case of cardiac arrest, we need the plastic. We actually need to run them uh, with the plastic. So uh, it, it is important to do that, to do it that way. And again, live, uh, well, they're in cardiac arrest, they're not live. So um, those are subtle uh, nuances. We don't have live cardiac arrest even in the field. So uh, I, I think uh, we don't need to split hairs there. The, 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 I think the, the spirit of the law is that we want to make sure that they practice cardiac arrest and clearly, you know, the mannequin is a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to practice patients with chest pain, patients that are saying, I have an altered mental status and, and you know, because they're having a stroke and have that be plastic. That's not a live encounter. So um, to answer Doug's question very specifically, it's best to have somebody acting like, okay, I've got from fair speech and I don't talk very well and I've got a lot of weakness if you're going to simulate a stroke versus having someone in a sterile room just talking to a piece of plastic going, can you hold up your arms? Well, they can't hold up their arms. That's not a live encounter. They can't you know, do the Cincinnati stroke. So it's better to do it live. Okay, there's another question here from Christopher. On the live scenario question, what if you use a, oh, sorry, that's that, well, that was a question on high fidelity. Okay, I'm hope, I hope I'm addressing all of your questions. Um, and I, I really do wanna make sure that um, uh, this is a bit interactive because uh, uh, if, if there are some that I'm missing, just ask them again and um, happy to do it. From Jessica, um, so you consider high fidelity simulator a live encounter. Once again, um, I, I typically think of high fidelity as both uh, a, a patient and um, uh, I guess I would say uh, a highly realistic environment and I will only use plastic as absolute, if absolutely necessary. I want to uh, use live humans as much as possible. So I'm a big fan of things like I simulate because it allows us to hook up leads to a real person um, and, and actually put the patches on and actually have to, you know, with their new stethoscope, listen and, and hear lung sounds, not just, you know, kind of touch a piece of plastic, which is not interactive. So as much as possible, these are live patients, human patients. Okay, um, going back here to uh, sort of sign-offs, there's a spot uh, both in the field and in the lab where somebody can actually sign the tablet if that's how you want to do it. If not, they can enter their password, and if not, the student can just simply uh, document it, and there could be a piece of paper. You take a picture of it, attach it to the shift, um, done. So you have the signature attached to the shift in case somebody wants to audit that, but um, uh, you, you've actually documented this properly and you move to the next encounter. Um, I just want to again say these are the same categories on the registry skill sheet. So when we're doing a per shift evaluation, which uh, in, the, in the latest webinar, Gordy specifically addressed this. You, you, a per shift eva a total evaluation of which ones are pass, fail, is absolutely appropriate. But you see that each one of these is a single patient encounter. So even if it's a per shift, there's a pass fail for each encounter that they had. And the cool thing about FISDAP is that it will give you this, uh, uh, in, the registry recommends that 18 out of the last 20 be successful in order to pass so you can run a Eureka graph and see how you're doing, how you're progressing. It's a separate report, so you, you have to go in and just ask for it uh, on, on the preceptor eval side, but you can graph any of these. From Brienne, you might have gone over this, but does the does completing the patient in the lab should also count towards their lab requirement? Yes, 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 now you're getting it. So once again, a patient in the lab is a patient in the lab. So all of those lab skills that are in Appendix G, if you're doing them in scenario, they all count. 
um, that's the insanity of having a goal of two because you would think that they'd actually practice this a lot more um, but we have to run them we have to see we can all start with the number two and then when we're actually keeping track of these things say wow we are, we accomplished way more than two um, and it's and it's realistic to be able to say in 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 lab they're gonna uh, really do a lot more assessments than just two patients all right now I'm going to recommend that you do a pit crew scenario approach. What do I mean? So this is taking off of the pit crew CPR concept. Um, it's sort of a highly efficient way of practicing scenarios. So this is what we've been doing at UCLA for a while, and, and I'll just kind of walk through the methodology. So if you recall before, if you only can do this with you know your your student, their partner, and a, a, a patient, whether they're part of the class, then you have to do it that way. But let's just assume that you have another pair of hands, and it's probably a good idea for people to kind of watch and learn from each other and give each other feedback. So there's an instructor in the room, they're supervising, they're making sure that um, things are properly documented, people are doing things correctly. Now, we're gonna actually have the students create their own scenarios. Why? Because not only do they know best what they need, and they'll be going, oh, better give me a scenario on this, but even without that concept, we want them to think, what are the signs and symptoms that these patients have? And we want them to try and challenge each other. We're gonna create a healthy environment in which they're, they're learning to actually not only you know, uh, uh, listen to what the signs and symptoms are, but act them out, okay? So uh, if you have an extra person, that's one of the places I recommend you put the person is to actually give the scenario. All right. Now, say you have an extra person. So we're going to call this the team leader scribe, okay? This is the, the person who's documenting for the team leader in real time. So as the scenario is occurring, the team leader scribe is entering a patient for that team leader. So that team leader does a physical exam, does it well, gets a check mark for a successful physical exam. They don't do the physical exam well, they don't get a check mark for it. And then they go through and document all the skills that they did, okay? So FISDAP in general, in all parts of FISDAP, you either observe or perform, and if you're performing it, you're performing it successfully. So you don't get credit for performing skills if they're not successful. Now, the team member has their own scribe. So the team member, uh, that somebody's watching a team member and they've got a, a, a patient in, and they've added a patient and in real time we have two patients being entered. Okay, well many of us have more than just one, two, three, four, five students in a class. Um, maybe we have lab groups that are six or seven or eight. No problem. You scale up. Think of this as ICS, span of control. You add another team member, then you add another watcher. And that scribe is documenting another patient uh, uh, contact. So as they're actually doing it in real time, they're, we're getting documentation and they're, they're performing each one of them uh, successfully. If they're not successful, then they get documented in, uh, in an eval. And we've got someone who's actually going to document the eval. Uh, so we can actually have somebody extra that's doing that. Um, so in, in this case, we'll just add a lab practice item. So we have someone who's just doing evals. Oh, that was a fail. Oh, that skill, so-and-so did that skill, and that's, that, that's a fail or that's a pass, while the others are documenting patients. So in real time, we can have all of this entire scenario documented, and upon finishing the 15-minute scenario, we just added Everybody has their patient documented, everybody has, the, everybody has the experience documented, and we can see what was successful and what was not. So let me just make sure that I'm not missing any questions here because um, I want to make sure to answer your questions. Um, so from Brienne, uh, oh, we answered that one from Kelly. Uh, do any team leads that have a zero or a one count as successful? No, the only the only score that's successful is a two. If you read the portfolio, one is kind of a partial. Um, it's uh, it, it, you would have had to prompt them. So really, two is the only successful one. Um, that's the that's the uh, uh, general approach. Um, and two should be across the entire 
portfolio across the entire um, uh, FISDAP platform, two is successful. It means that you wouldn't have had to prompt uh, for any critical things. Um, maybe, you know, if there were some style kind of things, but that's not a critical prompt. That's that's simply, you know, you could improve here or there, but that would have passed. That 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 constitutes a, if I was on a real scene, I wouldn't have had to intervene. You would have been able to handle it without any problem. All right. Now, uh, as we keep going here, this is a, a real-time lab. This is from a few years ago when I was teaching in Hills. You have a patient who happens to be one of the students. Um, they're, they're in yellow. Um, you have three people documenting because you have three team members. And you have an instructor who's walking around in the background, kind of um, making sure that all this is occurring, supervising, etc. Oftentimes people say, well, does that qualify for the right lab to student ratio? Well, you have control over how many people you put in the lab, so you can definitely keep the one to six if you'd like. But um, this this instructor is really eyes on these three people. So it's a three to one ratio um, if you're using a team teams of three or teams of two. And you're, uh, everybody, is in, including the watchers, are helping observe and catch errors that might have occurred. So sometimes the students are actually more picky than the instructors. All right. Um, I love the concept that, um, you know, the new I simulate reality is really cool because you can uh, stream this in another room and they can vote yes, no. Um, but in this case, I wanted to show you how we can do it with two team leader, team member, and then two watchers, and they're kind of multitasking here. Um, you know, one one's uh, putting in one tablet, the other one's the other. And in this case, it was before we had phones so nowadays you could actually use your uh, phone to enter some of these patients so uh, that's another way to do it all right so the big question is now that they've entered them in the most simplistic possible way possible just keep documenting the patients keep putting in the patients where do you see that on the reports and this is the beauteous part of the whole process remember when I uh, uh, pointed out here that you can hit next and in the reports section or the dashboard, oops, let me just back up a second. Um, you can, in, in the dashboard, the students can see uh, and toggle between the lab, the individual lab practice items, which are really not the ones that we want them to be practicing a lot of. Those are just onesie twosies, check them off, now go to scenarios. These goals, the graduation requirements that we set are gonna actually populate because these are patients. And if you see here, this is a UCLA paramedic goal. You can have as many goal sets as you want, semester one, semester two, semester three. You can have a you know, University of Texas goal set, a national registry goal set. You could have a, a appendix G goal set. I recommend that you have one graduation goal set so everybody knows how they're doing uh, uh, towards graduation. But if you want a semester one that says, just for semester one, what do I need to do? What, what are my, my, my goals? That's definitely one way to handle that. Um, I've seen some programs that actually created lab practice items that were like a long checklist of, this is just the lab practice items for this scenario. FISDAP allows you to put in a checklist for anything. So yay for FISDAP in, in that it's really super flexible. But that also means that you're sort of creating a FISDAP within a FISDAP. You're trying to create checklists that then don't populate reports. If you use the goal sets that are part of the, the patient requirements, then when you go run a goals report, so um, this is a, a very simple graduation report that comes off of the reports. You say, this is the goal set, I want the UCLA one. And here you have the option, is this including labs or not? So if you just wanna look at labs, you could just look at what's happening in labs, so what kind of patients they have in lab, or you could also just look at what's happening in the field and what have you seen there. Or if you're looking at all graduation, you can say, give me any, any live human that they have actually taken care of um, to see if we've actually met the goals of the curriculum. Um, so um, if we're looking at pediatric patients, uh, like Brianne is asking, and, and the age groups, then every one of these is actually populating in the right spot. And yes, we can use uh, patient populations in the lab to meet some of those requirements. So if you really don't have access in the hospital, which 
I still think even daycare centers or, or children's hospitals, are, are, you know, even clinics, uh, urgent, urgent cares, um, pediatric uh, ERs, they're going to see a lot of patients. The fact that they actually, in an urgent care or in a, they shy away from them, that's a different problem that FISDAP can't fix. It's more like, hey, do you see that that child? Go listen to their lung sounds. But if you can't get them, and you're really in a super rural environment and, the, and it's really going to be very hard for them to get to a daycare center, you could bring in a child to the classroom and as long as we've got, you know, parental consent and all those things, they can actually simulate um, the, 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 the asthmatic uh, uh, two-year-old or five-year-old or eight-year-old. All right. Um, uh, so moving right along, in FISDAP, we see that we can see those impressions in the graduation report. This has been there since the beginning of time. Because we want students to graduate not just with uh, Appendix G, we, there's actually a lot more requirements we might want to have other than just the minimums. And you can see the students who are not compliant or did not actually, uh, each one of these rows is a student, I just blocked them out because of, uh, of uh, HIPAA or FRIPA. Um, so, if in fact this student has less than required, then this student should not be graduating. This is a student who, if, if a, a site visitor sees this, they're gonna say, what happened here? Um, why is this student part of this cohort and they didn't meet minimums? And the nice thing about it is it turns green when you're, when you're done, when you're, they're ready to go. Um, so I, I know the widget looks cool, but the widget was never intended to capture all the graduation requirements. So relying on just the widget, I think is probably not very realistic. I would say to the students, run the graduation requirements report and show me that you are green across uh, across all the platforms and then you're ready to go. That's what that's what you, you know, on the syllabus would have to say. You need to um, we're going to go through uh, and, and show you a little bit of what FISDAP worked on just to give, you know, people who wanted an option to put the scenario type. If they didn't want to add a patient, they could just put it in a single uh, skill sheet. So you could ant enter team leader, the team leader lab practice item for a scenario. Again, I'm not recommending necessarily you do that, but if you wanted to, you could enter that eval. And then they entered, FISDAP allows you to enter a topic area. This uh, particular topic area is kind of a redundant topic area. So uh, if you're tracking things with the, the way we, I'm really recommending you do it with patients, you can have multiple field impressions, you can have multiple complaints, and it's okay. In this other methodology, you're in an eval, um, and you're, it's sort of kind of um, almost, uh, uh, it, it will only show up in uh, one part, right? One scenario, one topic, so right away, that means a lot more scenarios, um, but even more so, it's just unrealistic, and um, the only place it'll show up is in this portfolio section where you can go to a student's portfolio, select a student um, in, in the My Portfolio area, and you click on Lab Practice Items, and then you will see how many skill sheets had that particular type of complaint. I would highly recommend you not look at this. Forget it. Don't even think about it. Um, that I, I call that against academic advice because um, it won't populate your graduation goals. Um, those graduation requirements, it's just much simpler to say, track it like you always do. A patient goes in, look at your graduation goals. Um, and um, uh, as FISDAP improves and, and uh, it, it has other options for, for us to see where these scenario topic areas, that's one area that we uh, might see an improvement on. Again, these lab goals are only key to lab practice items. They're not key to scenarios. So I, I, I don't, it, it kind of encourages people to do single skill, single skill, single skill. And as you can see, um, uh, you know, people put in 50, 28, 30 single skills when in fact they should be doing all of those in a scenario. And uh, that's what uh, we kind of went sideways on, on lab practice items um, when really we, uh, yes, it's never been easier to track these, 
but I highly recommend in scenarios you track them uh, for patients. So I'll um, uh, kind of conclude with uh, saying that FISDAP is a powerful tool. It's got years and years of adding on to different parts of it because as we, the educators said, we want schedulers and we want to be able to keep track of evaluations and we want, you know, we want to be able to do testing and it's, it's got a lot of different parts to it and so sometimes it's really hard to know, well, where, where do I look? So these FISDAP tips and tricks kind of webinars are, are intended for people to go, oh, if I just go to eval and skills, I can check everybody, you know, make sure that everybody's audited instead of doing them uh, patient by patient. So um, I just want to uh, double check here as uh, as we conclude that I'm answering all your questions and, and these have been great. So from Nadine, uh, a few minutes ago you said that the skills have to be performed in a hospital or field as opposed to the scenario. Which of those skills? Um, once again, um, if you look at Appendix uh, G, and, and I'm going to um, jump to that, I think um, uh, it's, it's most likely on my screen. So if I jump to that Excel spreadsheet, um, some of these things say very specifically you must do them in the hospital um, and then or in the field. Um, some of them are actually individual evaluations in the lab uh, and you get to decide that when you set your goals. So very important for you to know how many you want to do in lab and how many you want to do in the field. Um, I ideally would like them to do as much as possible on live humans, um, so we want them to practice some of them before they go do it on a live human, but those are going to be those discussions that you sit down and think with your medical director, how many times do we want them to put on a splint before they can actually do it in, 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 on a live human? And is that something we're going to want to actually require an instructor checkoff, even if the COA doesn't? So I hope that answers your question, Nadine. Uh, from Doug, I may be missing the obvious, but if we use the patient method, thank you, yes, instead of the team leader evaluation form, how do we know how many scenarios the student has completed? That's the beauty of the graduation report. You say, I want to see all the patients they did in lab, and it's just like running hospital or field. I want to see the kinds of complaints they saw in the lab, and you'll be able to see all of those. Uh, again, if it's a positive team leader, then you're going to go into the team lead evaluations, and you're going to see those in the in the preceptor sign-off area. There's a report for preceptor sign-off, so you'll be able to see what they did. I highly recommend, as I said before, when you're adding the patient, if they were not successful, they do not get credit. So um, it's it's important when you're adding a patient and they're not successful that they do not get credit for an assessment or that on the team lead you go unsuccessful. Uh, they don't get credit for that team lead where it says I was a team leader on the patient. Um, they cannot click on that if in fact they did not um, do that successfully. So what you'll see in the reports is that they observed, they didn't perform because performance means it was positive. There's a little box that says I was the team leader, Students shouldn't be checking that in the hospital, the field, or the lab unless they were the successful team lead. Okay, um, here's uh, during the pit crew approach um, where there's uh, one, where one person entering the patient and one uh, for the team leader. How can another person evaluate the patient at the same time in FISDAP? So these are all, um, uh, you, you can be logged into FISDAP 50 different computers and it doesn't matter. In fact, you can have uh, the student who's logged into their, their uh, particular um, record, either with a tablet or a phone. Um, I usually have the students log into theirs and say, okay, I'm the team leader, enter my patient. And they hand the device over to the student. But you can also have a lab partner and they're logged in as a lab partner and they're entering the patient simultaneously, the person over there can go, I'm watching Dave Page do an assessment and I'm the evaluator and that's successful. So the evals and the patients are separate in FISDAP. Um, why is that? It's just the way the system developed and that's one of the improvements that would make FISDAP more powerful and I hope uh, in the future that happens. But for now, evals, you can have a stack of them, it can be enormous. Those are on one side of FISDAP and they don't tabulate well 
on your graduation reports. On the other side are patients, and those are the ones that, if successful, get checked off and get into the graduation report. So I hope that that kind of explains the difference between evals. Think of evals as a file cabinet full of paperwork. It's just nicely organized electronically, so every student will have their evals listed. But evals are not tied to patients. They, are, they can be entered all by themselves. It's one of the both powerful things and um, not so great things about FISDAP is that those evals are so totally separate. Um, so uh, here's another question about um, uh, from Brianne. Um, so uh, we don't need to worry about the lab practice stuff. Isn't that required for National Registry? Oh, I didn't say don't worry about it. I said we're going to document one or two or three or whatever our minimums are, and then we're going to move over to uh, the patient side. So yes, we do have to worry about it. Absolutely, we have to worry about lab practice items. We have to enter them and document that the ones, especially the ones that are starred here, um, that say, okay, this is an instructor uh, checkoff, so obtain a patient history, has a little star next to it, and says this has to be checked off by an instructor. And in this case, the COA is recommending it happen at least twice. Um, sorry, one instructor checkoff, it happens twice. One can be peer, one can be instructor, two can be instructor. You can have four that are instructor. It's up to you to determine what you want your program to set as a minimum individual skill. I would set those as few as possible and set the scenario ones as high as you can possibly do it because you want them practicing in that environment. You don't want them repeating the same, uh, uh, is my scene safe, is this my only patient, do I have every, all the resources I need? That's just blah, 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 diarrhea of the mouth. It's not actually can I handle a scenario. So the individual skills, check them off, put them in lab practice and set them aside and then start entering one caveat, got to make sure I repeat this in case it kind of got lost in a lot of other things. If you want to, you can enter more lab practice items. You can have an extra person entering evals, yes, no, positive, negative, you know, performing it correctly. That's fine. That's extra. Good job. Then every single skill that happened in scenario has an eval sheet too. Wow, super cool. If you're doing that pit crew methodology, you'll have one. But those are separate. Think of them as a file cabinet where you put all your evals, and the other one is our, the other ones are patients where we keep track of all of the different uh, complaints, etc. All right, uh, from Kelly, NRMT appendix uh, K from uh, zero, one, and two option for team lead evaluation. Is this subjective? Again, the uh, the one score to be allowed credit for successful. Um, uh, yeah, this gets into uh, less uh, about Appendix G and more about what's successful and what's not, but I'm happy to answer it. Uh, when we actually did an analysis, I was part of the uh, the group that looked at that. Well, we looked at you know the scales, the Likert scale from zero to five, and um, sorry, but all all preceptors rate their students three or four. So everybody's average. All my children are average. Um, nobody's perfect. Nobody's terrible. You're kind of okay. So we based this off of prompting. And if you go look at the eval sheet, which I'm I'm happy to pull up again just to make sure that everybody sees it, um, the concept here is about how much prompting did you get? And if you actually put a one, it says very clearly you're not yet competent because you've required so many prompts or a couple of critical prompts that you're not quite there yet. So a single critical prompt, hey, you know, you actually kind of needed to do CPR, that could fail you and you get a big fat zero. But enough of the, uh, you know, sort of, it, actually, you probably need to give them some uh, something for that pain. And uh, actually, you might not want to lift the stretcher that way. That's not the safest way to do it. And um, so some of those might be critical. Some of them might just add up to, this is kind of too much prompting. I really want to be able to be hands off. When we use that, 
it was less subjective than, oh, let me see, on a scale from zero to five or zero to 10, I think that's um, the three. Uh, in fact, thinking of it like you're the preceptor, you're in the field, would you allow that to happen on a real patient? No, I would intervene. Well, that's a critical prompt. Um, if in fact you say, oh no, I'm watching this and uh, I would fluff the pillow differently, I'd probably put that splint on differently, but they put a splint on and they, you know, gave it ice and maybe they could have, you know, uh, elevated it, but they put a splint on and they iced it. And so that's okay. Then you wouldn't have prompted them. And so that's a two, that's a, I wouldn't have prompted them. Uh, it really has to do with that, that sort of, are you doing something that's going to hurt the patient? And when you apply that logic back to the classroom, that same form that you use for the team leader evaluation um, is actually exactly asking you zero, one, and two also. So it's the same methodology and the same explanation, and it's in the National Registry um, uh, uh, um, forms. And once again, if you're doing a focused interview and you're asking the right questions that are about stroke, but you forgot to ask them if they were, you know, if there's any chance that they can be pregnant, then that doesn't apply because you're taking care of a stroke patient and maybe they could be pregnant if they're the right age, but it doesn't apply because um, that's not the complaint or maybe it does apply. And then you think, okay, maybe you've got the stroke from another reason and you are pregnant. Those are decisions that we make based on differential diagnosis and every single patient has that sort of, which are your differentials? What do you need to account for? What's the interview? What's the physical exam that we need to do? So I hope that's helpful in kind of saying, yeah, of course, every rating in the entire world is subjective. Even, even when we measure two centimeters, somebody had to decide at some point, this is a centimeter or this is an inch. Um, but hopefully by having consensus agreements that say, on this scenario, which is all about the scenario validation workshops that we did and we continue to do. Um, in fact, if you want to, I would highly encourage you to participate in a scenario validation um, event online in FISDEP, where instructors are actually debating these things and saying, well, if I have a 24-year-old with slurred speech who was recently pregnant and gave birth, then probably asking stroke questions would be a critical criteria. So that is critical criteria for that scenario. When we use um, scenarios that are for high stakes testing, no different than um, evaluations that are written evaluations like exams uh, for high, skills, uh, high, high stakes testing, we have to make sure that they're reviewed by your medical director, by a team of your faculty, and that um, we look at their, their reliability, their validity, look at the item analysis. Multiple choice questions or scenarios, same difference. These are evaluation tools that might exit a student or pass a student, and so we wanna uh, make sure that we use uh, validated instruments for all of those types of high stakes scenarios. If it's low stakes and it's formative and you say, you know, actually, I, I think you really should ask those questions. I think we'd probably, be, probably need to repeat it. Might be a one, better repeat it. It has to do with the, the criticality of the prompt and how, uh, how important it is uh, for that particular patient. All right, I think we've addressed all the questions. Um, would love your feedback about this webinar as well as uh, uh, what other webinar uh, topics might be helpful for you. Um, so uh, FISDAP Tips and Tricks uh, is, is coming and it's staying, and we can have guest uh, instructors and speakers that say, well, you know, I actually do it this way, um, and, um, and that would be awesome. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll incorporate other people as well, but uh, uh, we do intend to talk about how to use a scenario bank and how to set goals uh, in the near future. So please tune in uh, as, we, as we continue on this journey together to find the best way to document what our students are doing and then find the best ways to uh, have the right requirements uh, for our students because I think we owe it to them to actually do these uh, uh, properly and to, to document and, and improve with every, every course that we give. So again, um, send us Thanks. your feedback. Thank you, Dave. Um, I really want to appreciate, I want to let everybody know that we appreciate that you stayed on longer as well as everybody who was able to stay on longer. I do think there are a few more questions. We, oh. I've copied those down and we will send those to Dave. Um, 
I think he shared his contact information. And Dave, if you can share that one more time, that screen, that'd yeah, be great. Yeah, absolutely. In case we missed someone, there were a lot of questions flying back and forth. Um, I think this has been really great information. I think it, everyone would agree it's been really fantastic. Um, we appreciate you sharing your expertise. And again, if you have questions for Dave, he's got his contact information on the screen. Please do not hesitate to contact him directly. Uh, we will forward the questions that we know we missed. A couple other housekeeping items. This session was recorded. We will have it available as soon as we can for uh, viewing later. And um, the next scenario development online session is June 7th. I believe Tim Wright is the one that's hosting that. So uh, please feel free to join him. I'm sure he'd love to have you there. Uh, we look forward to having you on the future FizDap Ticks and Tricks webinar. And thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.